Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Normalize This Shit. I'm your host, Dr. Matthew Moffitt, and today I'm with Dr. Emily Bell, who is a clinical psychologist in the primary care mental health integration program at the Veterans Health Administration. She has previously worked in primary care behavioral health for the U.S. Air Force and is an assistant professor at a college of medicine. Dr. Bell received her BA from Knox College, her MA in experimental psychology, really experimental, I didn't know that, from the College of William and Mary, and her PhD in clinical psychology from Kent State University. She lives with her husband and son, and in her spare time, she likes to collect antique books and participate in research projects. Um, Today's episode, we're going to be talking about imposter syndrome. Welcome, Emily. How are you? I am great. How are you, Matt? I'm doing okay. I'm a little tired. Um, Just finished a day with patients, so I'm just kind of, I'm winding down. This is nice to talk to you after being a therapist for the last six hours. Yeah, well, I can't guarantee you won't have to be one for me, too. (laughs) I'm talking about some raw stuff here. Yeah. Are you, are you, wait, just really quick. Are your therapy sessions 30 minutes or an hour? 30. Oh, I'm jealous. I'm just kidding. My, <laughs> well, well, maybe we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, well, first question, you know, why I ask this on every guest, why did you pick imposter syndrome and, you know, how did it come up in your personal life or just why do you think this topic is really important for people to discuss? Well, I picked imposter syndrome because um, I had a lot of experience with it. And um, I had kind of an unusual experience with it, I feel, because um, I uh, I feel like I experienced, you know, every person with imposter syndrome's worst fear. And it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, so, yeah, I have, I have a lot of thoughts on it, basically. Um, it's something, you know, everybody with a talent or a skill or um, an accomplishment, a dream that they have. Um, that's everybody listening. That's you, mm-hmm. Matthew. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Everybody has experienced something like this. So uh, I think it's it's very relevant to a lot of people. And that came up for me because you know I've also had a lot of experience with it. It's a very uh, human thing, I think. I think anyone yes. I talk to, either clients or um, friends, colleagues, I think we all struggle with imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, I, you said that the worst thing or your worst fear is the worst fear of imposter syndrome is everyone finding out that you're the imposter. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So I would say if I'm going to define it, um, that it's, uh, so you have a, you, you have something that you do a role an activity. Um, and you really value having success in that or having a talent in that. Um, But the really human thing about it is that it's not just within yourself. You're you're displaying this talent, this role, this activity. You're you're doing that with other people watching. Um, So the imposter syndrome comes when you're believing in some way you might actually be faking your success or faking your talent. Um, So maybe you're just kind of, can I get you an explicit tag? Can I uh, swear on here? Oh, yeah. There's... there's Uh, Oh, wonderful. It's, it's, it's been there since, I mean, it has normalized this shit. So go ahead. <laughs> oh, good. Good point. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's kind of a fear that you might actually be faking it kind of like you've been bullshitting the whole time mm-hmm. and you've just been skating through. Maybe you're riding on people's coattails. Um, maybe, uh, you know, others just perceive you as successful, perceive you as talented, but really behind the scenes, you're not truly at the level that they perceive. There's something that you're doing, you feel that maybe is a little illegitimate. And the worst fear is that, you know, eventually everything's going to come crumbling down. They're going to figure it out. They're going to figure out that you're not cut out for this role, that you're not actually that talented at this activity and something's going to happen. Would you say, I mean, I think that this applies to every role that we like, like if it's academics, if it's, yeah being a parent, but I I feel like it's more like we commonly see it in workplace settings, right? Of like, yes, I've I've worked really hard for this thing. And yet I I feel like when people either, you know, they compliment me or they uh, put me in a position that is a very kind of status position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you, you feel like, well, wait a minute. Like, I don't know if, 
a common thought or going a bit therapeutic of an automatic thought is yeah. I shouldn't be here. Right? right. How did I get here? Um, because I, I think that I'm, that comes up with, for me a lot, but I, you know, I guess you could say that it is applicable everywhere, but workplaces where I usually see it, do you yeah. usually see it in workplace settings too? Workplace, school, anywhere where you have to perform any performance thing, yeah. way that, you know, you've got other people in that role who are looking at you who are having some sort of, I would say, uh, some sort of static, uh, I guess you can say criteria for success. And school and work are, um, are areas where there do tend to be static criteria and there tend to be very, um, very visible uh, results of what we call success in those areas. So a promotion an A plus, um, getting your doctorate, for example, um, mm -hmm. you know, passing your comps, getting the raise, you know, there's something that's actually um, displaying that, you know, you've had some sort of success. It's very concrete. So it tends to come up in those areas, I think, although it could be, yeah, it could be parenting. Um, I thought about maybe athletic pursuits. This is something mm -hmm. I have almost zero experience with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there could be other other possibilities, yeah, but I do yeah. see it in those realms a lot. There's a, it's kind of, okay, let me ask this. Do you feel, like, like what is your experience in, and I guess I can answer this question too if you want me to answer it, but have you always felt that way? Like, well, like if you, when you were struggling with imposter syndrome, it wasn't just when you got the status uh, or when you got the promotion or the raise where you got your PhD, it was the several steps along the way. Like, for example, getting into graduate school. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, do they, they really chose me? Like, why mm -hmm. would they want, why would they want me? I mean, that's a very common thought that I'm, yeah. you know, imposter syndrome people have. I think that a lot. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it's every step along the way and people have a tendency, you know, when they take that next step, they have that next success. They're like, oh, well now I got to perform really well and get to the next step. I got to have my next success experience. And what if I shouldn't even be at this step? Then how am I going to get to the next one? It's all going to come crashing down. And then it doesn't. And then you think it again. I think uh, part of the reason we have imposter syndrome is because when you have a certain activity or role, you really value it. You're, you're often are pretty good at it. Um, you see everything behind it. You know, you're inside your head, you're inside your office, you're the one who's actually doing all that work. And you, so you see all the mistakes that you make, or you see all the procrastination that you engage in. Hmm. You, you see all of that, but then other people mostly see the final product. Yeah. So and we wonder, do the mistakes really, do they negate that final product that everyone is seeing? Are they going to overtake me at some point? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that where we are, like in in the setting itself, um, make, is almost conducive to that. And I'm referencing, you know, like, for example, clinical psychology. Yeah. How, I mean, it, it's, and I'm not, not meaning to rant upon graduate school, but <laughs> just as a bit of a digression, you know, people that have been in, any graduate program, but you know, when you're getting your PhD, it's almost a, a rigorous self-critical self-analysis pressurized uh, yeah. pressure cooker of you should not be feeling good about this. Like almost that's the feeling you should have. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not doing well enough. And so it's this weird thing to get into a PhD program and then go from like elation to be like, Oh, well maybe I'll feel good now that I, someone's told me externally that I, you know, I can do it. And then you get in and then you still feel the same. And now it's actually worse because everyone's expecting you yeah. to be up on your game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so much of that, so much of what we're looking at comes from the outside. We're putting a lot of stock in what other people think. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that's just a human thing. We put a lot of stock in what other people think because in a lot of ways, other people are who kind of control our destiny you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's a huge fear is what are they going to think? Are they going to know that something's wrong? And that fear, I think it, a big problem with it is it's, it can actually hold you back from really 
deeply engaging in the thing that you actually value. It's, it's this activity or this uh, role and you really value it for whatever reason, but that holds you back. The imposter syndrome can actually keep you from, you know, engaging in it fully from actually having some success. It can keep you from wanting to have success because if you don't take that next step, if you're not successful, nobody expects you to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost a mediocrity yeah, syndrome then. Yeah. Then, then you go to like, I'll just perform bare minimum so that nobody ever has to ever see me drop from that. Right. Yeah. Has to fail. yeah that's a hazard of it. Um, and another hazard, you know, is feeling really anxious about getting started with something. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of that, you know, perfectionism. I don't know if I really want to even start this because what if I don't do a good job? It's almost you're setting yourself up to not do a good job. You know, you're guaranteed to not do a good job at something if you don't do it. Yeah. So it makes it, it hard it, to start something. Imposter syndrome is very much a self-fulfilling prophecy too. It can be. Yeah, for sure. You know, like I, I, um, I think a lot about when you, when you were mentioning, how do you, like discussing that we look externally for people to give us the validation. Uh, yeah. I, I look to my writing a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, I've been writing now for, um, and I think it's because I've been writing so long and haven't gotten anywhere with it that yeah. it's like, I've been writing for over a decade. And at first I was like, you know, like if something good happened, I'd be like, Oh, like, like, you know, the, it's probably was because, you know, I got lucky or something like that. And, and then at this point it's, it's, I've, I thankfully, at least with my writing, I stopped worrying so much about what other people think and mm -hmm. just being like, do you enjoy sitting down at the computer and writing the story that you're writing? If you, if you do it, if you do that and you like that, then do it. But it's taken me, you know, over 10 years to get to that place where I kind of let go of what somebody yeah. is expecting of me right? Like, or like what they're going to think if I release this out into the world and like, you know, oh, like this is the worst thing I've ever read. And this is, you know, mm -hmm. we would never make this movie or novel or whatever. Yeah. You know, versus, yeah. So how did you, how do you feel like you got to that point? You said it took you a long time. Um, and probably doing what you did, which is you have your worst fear realized. You get ah. so many rejections. I mean, I, got, I get so many rejections that I was, because I initially started writing and I, I would initially think, oh, if this gets published, then then I'll feel good about myself, right? Uh -huh. if, if I sell this many, then I'll feel good about myself. And that never happened, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I wrote and I continue to write and you get so many rejections piling up that, you know, you kind of look yourself in the mirror and go, okay. Matt, you may never, ever get to the place that you want to be. Do you still going to do this? Or are you still going to write? And the answer was yes. And it's because I love to do that. So I let go yeah. of all, you know, I let go of all the expectations of, is this producer going to like this? Right. Yeah. I can't, I can't control that. So I'm just going to write what I think is a good story. And if they like it, great. If they don't screw them, you know, yeah. I'll move on to the next one. Find somebody that says yes. Yeah. You know, that's such a hard place to get to. Um, and yeah. I think that's, that's one of the approaches you could take toward um, addressing your imposter syndrome is, um, you know, identifying what you actually value and, yeah. you know, what you yeah. want your life to be about. Um, not in relation just to the activity or to the role, but, you know, just generally, what do you want to be guiding your life? What's really important to you? And, and thinking about that in a broader way yeah. than just this activity, this role broadening that and seeing how does the activity still help you help you move toward, you know, live within those values, even if you're not having the success you might like or having the validation of other people, or even if you are, you know, you can actually buy it. It's buying the fact mm. that other people think this is pretty good. Mm. You don't second guess can yourself, I you know? Yeah. Can I ask you, since you, you asked me, how did you get to the place? Like what happened to you that you kind of got over in the sense of feeling like an imposter? What was that worst fear experience? If you don't mind sharing. 
I do not mind. So this is, this may be a radical way to go about it, but I'm a bit of a risk taker. Um, so my dream since I was probably 19 was to um, be a professor primarily because I wanted to do research. I wanted to be a researcher. That was it. That's why I did a master's in experimental psychology. Um, but uh, so I did that. I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to be a researcher. I spent uh, the next, gosh, 12 years working toward that. Um, I had a lot of what you might call uh, roadblocks along the way. I actually applied to grad school three times. Um, I didn't know that. On three really? occasions, yes. Um, wow. And each Wait time, each time I had to go with my plan B. So I've had, yeah, I've had a lot of these kinds of experiences, but I kept pushing it because that's what I, you know, this is what I really wanted. Um, I did eventually, you know, I got my doctorate and I did eventually become a professor, as mm -hmm. you may recall. Um, yeah. As I was your, one of your supervisors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you turned out, turned out great. I didn't clarify that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, That's because of my great supervision for those <laughs> listeners out there. Dr. Bell is a supervisor of mine. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I did become a professor. Like I achieved my dream, but I kept, you know, I had that imposter syndrome. I kept disqualifying it. You know, I thought um, I'm, I'm a professor, but it was, you know, I got this job because I knew somebody or you know, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing my research, but I'm, it's not really that I'm not really doing very well at it. My ideas aren't that good. Um, I can't really get to a point where I can pursue them. I'm not getting, you know, to the point where I get a grant. I'm just not getting the things that I wanted to accomplish. And it was very fun to do research until I got in the real world and I ran the whole show it got a lot more difficult. I started to realize like, I'm not actually cut out for this the way I thought. And I had to give that a lot of thought, you know, is this imposter syndrome or is this real? Maybe this isn't actually for me. Mm -hmm. I kept pushing though, because I thought, you know, no, this is what I've worked for. I have, I have to do this. It's the sunk cost fallacy. And that's something that I think goes along with imposter syndrome quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So you can fight your imposter syndrome. You could talk yourself out of it. You can tell yourself your accomplishments, but sometimes you're really actually just not as cut out for something as you originally thought it might not be for you. So what ended up happening was um, I, I was doing primarily research at my job. I did some supervision. I saw a few patients here and there. I really didn't want to spend my career seeing patients. I just wanted to do clinical research. I wanted to help as many people as I could, but kind of from behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I figured research was the way to do that. You you help a lot of people because you publish a paper that tells a lot of people how to help all those people. You know, um, So that was my goal. That was something I valued. But um, I came back from a leave of absence and was told, you know, you you don't have a grant for your research. Um, why are we letting you do this? Hmm. You, we're not going to let you do your research anymore. Um, we're going to cut your supervision time in half and we're going to have you m primarily see patients. And I kind of said to myself, well, that's not what I came here to do. That's not what I got this degree to do. And they're not letting me do what I want to do. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to see patients, I kind of want to see them somewhere else. Maybe I want a different job. Maybe I want to just try something different. And I applied to jobs. I took the first job that I got. I walked in my first day, not exactly knowing what my role was going to be. Um, I found out I was going to be working in the primary care clinic as a consultant and so I was like, okay, well, I'll do this. And if I don't like it, I guess I'll get another job. But clearly, I'm not afraid to get new jobs. Um, but uh, I loved it. I loved it. I found that it was actually a way to fulfill that thing that I valued about research, which was helping a lot of 
people, you know, having a widespread influence on, you know, people that needed some sort of, uh, you know, psychological intervention, because I, uh, well, I'm not going to go too much into the primary care model, but I was able, it's more of a public health psychology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I loved it. I've continued to do it. I feel like I'm actually good at it. So, um, yeah, I, I guess in a way I kind of got found out because they were like, uh, you're a researcher, but you're not really doing much research, are you? Mm. Was that? Because now when I look back on in my case, in my scenario yeah. where, you know, I found it eventually very freeing yes. to be found out. Um or like you try so hard and you just reach the wall, right? Nothing's nothing's budging and you, you have to face, you know, in the sense of the quote unquote truth of the scenario, which in, in my case was maybe you're not cut out for this. And it's not that I'm not, but having that conversation with yourself allows you to let go. Cause you're, cause you yeah. know, Emily, you're certainly cut out for like, you could do grant research if you really wanted to, right. like if you had it, you know, I mean, if that's what you put your mind to, like, you can do that. But, uh, how, yeah, I want to just going back to that. How did you feel right away when they had that conversation with you? And then looking back now, do you feel freeing from it? Or, yeah, you know? I mean, right away, I felt kind of resentful. <laughs> but mm. now, you know, I look back and I'm so, I'm so glad that happened. It's, it's, something where I, I was kind of buying into that sunk cost fallacy, which is, you know, I, I worked so hard for this thing. I've spent so much time. I've spent so much energy, so much money. I'm, I'm not sure I like it, but I better keep doing it when yeah. really it might be better to cut bait and try something else. And it kind of allowed me to do that. And so, yeah, it's very a, free. So you, you bring up an interesting point, which is a lot of time going through the imposter syndrome when you're in it, you're saying to yourself what you should be doing. Yeah. What you, how should I behave? What, uh, you know, program or research should I do? What should my colleagues think of me? And then when you actually have that kind of, you know, come to Jesus moment, so to speak, it's, do you actually like this? Yeah. Do you actually like what you're doing? Right. You know, because now the, the masquerade's gone. And you kind of have this ability to say, okay, you know, do you like writing or do you like actually doing this job and writing grants? Um, is that what you want to do? And that I think is that those are the lies we tell ourselves that kind of reiterate imposter syndrome was we're always asking what should we do, right? Yeah. Like versus having the space to say, you know what, do I really, really enjoy what I'm doing right now? And if I do, then I'm going to keep doing it. But if I don't, then I, I do need to cut and run. I need to not pay attention to the uh, sunk cost fallacy. I'm looking at my stocks right now. And I'm going, oh, my God, talk about sunk cost. <laughs> I have not looked in a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. you know, the whole thing about imposter syndrome is you're worried that you're kind of lying to other people, but maybe you're actually lying to yourself. You yes. might be lying to yourself a about like – you know, I'm not that good at this. I'm not cut out. You might be lying to yourself about that. You might be great at it. You might be cut out for it. You just, you know, you lack the confidence. Um, no. Or maybe, maybe you're not. Maybe you need to try something else. And, you know, maybe you need to kind of like you did do that same thing, but for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. You need to change your purpose of why you're doing yeah. it. Yeah. I think, I think people, because you made some notes here before the, um, before we started recording, like a lack of pride and accomplishment in what you're doing is a effects of an imposter yeah. syndrome. Rationalizing your accomplishments, like, like, like you said, I, I got this award because I knew somebody. Right. Um, achieving less than your potential uh, due to wanting to lower your expectations. We talked about that a bit. Um, and then sacrificing your fulfillment. Right. Uh, in your life, I, I, I think that. Yeah, I just wonder where, because for me, I I think I've always felt that way. Like I've always felt like, oh, like 
people are seeing something in me that I'm not seeing in myself. And it, it doesn't matter if it's writing or if it's like for me, when I was younger, it was, I was a very good soccer player. Yes. So I know. I, you know, people were always talking about how good I was at right. soccer. Um, but I think, I think for me personally, I, you know, my own exploration, it comes from very personal familial issues as to why I feel that sure. way in any given situation. Um, but, you know, from your perspective, where do you think that comes from? What about you? Where do you think it comes from personally, as much as you're willing to share? Like, I, I'd be curious to know that. Where does the uh, imposter syndrome come from in the first place? Yeah, like where's the where's the the birth of that hmm. for people, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm wondering, I'm trying to think about me because – I'm wondering if it's something about the expectations placed on you when you're a child. Um, hmm. I had very, I was kind of a weird child. Uh, are you shocked? Um, what? <laughs> what? Me? Um, I, I had um, parents who put a lot of stock in, you know, success in school, success in music, dance. I did all kinds mm. of stuff. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I would get an A maybe like, why wasn't it an A plus, but um. you know, I, I've always been a, a little, a little irreverent, which I think has helped me. Um, I was the kid who was like, why do I need an A plus? It's not a big deal. It's like, I, I got an A that's pretty good. I don't know why they're pushing me at this. Yeah. Um, I was anti-authority. <laughs> yeah. Were, were I score a little authority? high on scale for them and PI. Um, um <laughs> anyway, <laughs> little inside joke between psychologists there. Um, yeah, there yeah. we go. Four nine. I'm a four nine. Just, <laughs> but, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but no, you're not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it, it can come from things like, like that feeling like you have to really measure up and that it, you know, you're getting good grades, but you've just figured out how to get good grades, not so much how to do well at the actual thing that you're getting good grades at. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. it's almost like, you know, I'm great at standardized tests, but do I really know the material? It, it becomes that mm -hmm. you're, you doubt the underlying reason for why you're performing well, because the performance is the goal, not the actual learning. Yeah. You it, know? Yes. And it's, it's the performance that matters. Right. Like we, we, if you're in imposter syndrome in the midst of being an imposter or feeling like you're an imposter, the, the performance is what matters most, not the substance, yes. right. Of, of your life or your values. And like, like we talked about earlier, your fulfillment of something. I see a lot of patients, unfortunately, and I don't know if it's like, you know, not to do a digression on the American school system, <laughs> but the, the idea of you're 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 pushing so hard to achieve something yet yet stopping and asking like okay one do you understand it two do you like it um three is it important to you is it important to you to study this thing you know what i mean versus like the performative aspect is is everybody else seeing that i got that a right you know did i get that promotion right some people don't want the promotion because it takes extra responsibility and things that, you know, they don't right, like to right. do. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I'm seeing that in my uh, own immediate circle right now. Um, oh yeah. I won't go into that, but um, that's other people. <laughs> but um, yeah. And this makes me think of, this makes me think of another time when I, I actually was probably good at something, but really wasn't enjoying it. So the substance wasn't there, even though I think objectively the um, performance was there. So when I was in college, I've played a lot of musical instruments. I played, what did, what have I played? Violin for probably nine years. I played oboe for about eight. I played clarinet. I played the glockenspiel. Um, wow. <laughs> I, uh, and then the, the final one in college, I started to play jazz piano. I never uh -huh. played piano before. Um, 
and I was taking, you know, private lessons um, for my class, basically. It was a private lesson. And the teacher just like would look at me amazed, like, you're so good at this. How are you picking this up so quickly? Like, you're, you're really good. I was like, huh? That's great because I'm not practicing, but cool. And he was like, I really want you to, you know, I wouldn't normally do this this quickly, but I really want you to be in a jazz combo. I was like, okay, jazz, jazz combo. combo. So I was placed in jazz combo with several people who um, had played jazz for quite a while. I played their instruments quite a while. I'd played maybe five months at most. Um, and I played in the combo. I had practice. uh Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. This was 20 years ago, and I remember that. And you'll see why. Because <laughs> one day I thought back over my week. And I was like, you know, if I make a graph of my mood over the week, it's my mood is best. I'm happiest at 7 p.m. Tuesday evening. And it's gradually declining until... 6 p.m. to the next Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. shoots right mm. back up. And I was like, you know, this is a pattern. What do I do at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays? I go to combo practice. And it was telling me, Interesting. Yeah. this is not something that I actually like to do. I don't really enjoy this. In fact, I'm miserable. So everybody was shocked and disappointed, but I, uh, I quit. Yeah. With the combo and I've been, right. and I, I realized like, it wasn't that I had the wrong instrument this whole time. I started playing music when I was probably six, five or six. It wasn't that I had the wrong instrument. It was that I don't like playing musical instruments. Hmm. What a great example, you know, of getting like the message that society tells us, right. Of, how we should use our talents. Yeah. If we have a talent, it must be used and it must be um, exhausted. Yes. Right. If you're good at something, you must do it to the point that you can't do it anymore. Yeah. Almost, you know what I mean? Like, I say that of like, I would reference sports um, and, and the idea that if you can, I don't know, what would my, what would my teammates, when I got to college, my teammates would be able to, um, I run a mile in like four minutes and 30 seconds. I could run a mile in six minutes. My teammates could run a mile a minute and 30 seconds faster than mm -hmm. I can. And it's like, okay, if you can do that, then you should continue to push yourself but and, and continue to play at, at a high level and, and do all that stuff. But do you want to play sports or do you like doing other things? Yeah. I mean, if you're unhappy every Tuesday at 6 p.m., taking action and changing for yourself because you are going to be happier. And what is, what is a life for yourself that lacks fulfillment? Right. Why would you want to be doing things that are, you don't feel fulfilled in? Even if you're good at them, you don't want to be doing them if you're not fulfilled. I guess the bottom line, it sounds like is um, if you're good at something, you don't have to do it. And if you're not good at something, you can still do it. Yes. Because you enjoy yeah. it. Because it makes it you depends feel on what your what your goal is. Is your goal success? Is your goal a perception of success? Is your goal a certain level of accomplishment, or is your goal to live a life that you feel is valuable, fulfilling, genuine, where you feel like you're in harmony? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I every time we talk, you know. I talk about this with someone about not feeling good enough or feeling like an imposter. I think of that. I don't know if you ever watched this YouTube clip, but it's, it's Jim Carrey and he's coming out to give an award for the golden globes. And the announcer says it's two time golden globe winner, Jim Carrey. And of course, Jim Carrey comes out and he's, he's already got a smirk on his face. And he says, he tells the audience, I'm two time golden globe winner, Jim Carrey. And he says, so when I go to sleep at night, you know, I go for some much needed shut eye. I'm not just a guy that goes to sleep. I'm two time golden globe winner, Jim Carrey that goes to sleep. And then, and then he says, and do you know what I dream about? I dream about being three time <laughs> golden globe winner. <laughs> and, he, and he even says, cause then I would be enough. 
and the and then it would all be true. All, all those things that I've been, you know, insecure about. And it's totally true. Yeah. I, you, you laugh at that, but like, that is how most people feel yes. no matter what they accomplish. Constantly on a treadmill. Right. I, <laughs> yeah, I dream of being three time golden globe winner. I dream of publishing a novel or I dream of getting this degree or I dream of this position mm -hmm. in my work. But then why are you dreaming that? I think what you're trying to say is why are you dreaming that? Is it a performative thing? Cause then people will be satisfied with you or is it for yourself? You know, what are you working towards? Are you working towards it for other people or for you? Right. Right. Yeah. I think we've kind of hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, it, you know, because I know you, I think I think your your dream is just to sit down and watch Twin Peaks <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I watch it. I, I yeah, I watch Twin Peaks: The Return once a year when I'm ready. It's oh, usually in the summer. So my dream is yeah. to continue to do that for the rest of my life. I have been trying to get my wife to watch the first original Twin Peaks for literally years. She's so she she gets scared. She's scared of Twin Peaks, what? Emily. Yeah, she gets she gets frightened of Twin Peaks. I'm like, that's what scares you, Twin Peaks. Like she's scared of watching Twin Peaks, or she's scared of the content. Yeah, like she thinks of no. Yeah, she's scared of the thriller aspect. I'm like, it's not that thrillery. It's you know, it's there's parts of it that are like you know, kind of unsettling, yeah. but it's, it's it's very soap opera. -y. I try to tell it's her, it's not a thriller you know, so much as it's freaking bonkers. <laughs> it's just, it's David oh, yeah. Lynch, right? It's David Lynch. Okay. <laughs> so what can we do? Yeah, we could, we could, we could literally spend an entire oh, we really podcast talking about Twin Peaks. Okay. What can people do? How do we address our own imposter syndrome? How do we, how do we do this? How do we start fixing this? Well, I mean, I think first you have to figure out like, um, if first, you know, question yourself a little bit about this. You have to step back from what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and just ask yourself a few questions. So ask yourself like, all right, if the ultimate fear is other people might find out, how are they going to find out? So far, they don't seem to have found out. They don't seem to see you as an imposter. So how would they know? What would tell them? You know, get very specific. So then you know your your specific actual fears. What's, what's actually going to tell them and how are they going to find out? See if that's actually realistic. Um, think about how likely those things are to happen. Um, and also, you know, look at it from some other angles, like um, what do you think these people see in you that makes them think you aren't faking it? And mm. other people in your role, what do you see in them that makes you think they aren't faking it? So why do you look at yourself and say, I must just be faking this. I'm not genuine. When you look at other people doing the same thing and you see that as genuine. So for example, you know, I think, you know, as we know, we're both parents of small children. Um, mm -hmm. There's oh, yes. always that, you know, worry for people. And this is a form of imposter syndrome. I think, you know, I'm a bad parent. This thing mm -hmm. happened. I'm a bad parent. Look at all these other people on social media with their beautiful children, always perfect. And my house is a wreck mm -hmm. of toys. I got goldfish crackers mashed into the floor. <laughs> my kid is just like on the floor, kicking the TV. Like, you know, uh, that's, so <laughs> that's so validating. That's so validating. Yeah, you, that's a form of imposter syndrome. But when you look at other people, you know, do you ever think you know, somebody who's not abusing their kid, you know, do you ever look at them and think, yeah, they're, they're probably a bad parent. Probably not very good mm. at this. You, you yeah, don't really yeah. call other people that you call yourself that. And I think that goes back to you're seeing all the parts of you. Other people are not seeing everything that goes into this role mm -hmm. for you. Um, or they have a different judgment about it. And you so yeah, look, is there anyone who has the same activity and role that you think is an imposter? Like, how can you tell? What have you done about it? Okay. If somebody's a scammer, if they're out conning people, what have you done about it? Mm -hmm. You probably don't have anybody like that. And if you are, you know, if there is, become a whistleblower, you make a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. 
another thing, you know, I think is good is to talk to other people that you, um, that you do respect, you know, people that you think are genuine people that you respect, maybe in your field that you respect as a parent, as an athlete, whatever it is. And, you know, just ask them if they ever had an imposter syndrome. These people that you look at and you're like, they're such a success. They're so well known. They, they are so on top of it. Have they ever felt this way? I like that one. Ask yourself some questions. Yeah. The the idea the how do you you pose this question in some of the notes I was reading, you said, how do we feel like our genuine self? Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, that, that goes along with values. Right. But I think a lot of times we are leading lives in which we don't feel like our genuine self. Right. Right. Like you, you mentioned earlier in the podcast that how much of it is that you think you're lying to other people versus you lying to you about, you know, and I think, I think there's two things with that of like, oftentimes if you have imposter syndrome, you are lying to yourself about your capability. Like you're more capable than what you think you give yourself yeah. credit for. Right. Right. Like you can, you're, you know, you're capable of doing these things, but like you said, anxiety comes with the imposter syndrome and therefore you feel like there's difficulty initiating tasks or completing mm-hmm. things or not having pride in your in accomplishments um, and stuff like that. But then there's like the, the, the deeper kind of core line, which is I have a value or a thing I, I may have in my life that I want to do, but I'm telling myself I should be doing yeah. something else. Right. Like, for performative yeah. reasons, right? You know, and there's that there's that dissonance of like, there's a disconnect between my genuine self and the things I do every day in my life, which are the performative things. And, you know, you kind of behaviorally have to force that out. You have to be your genuine self, even though that's yeah. difficult, right? You know, it's okay, you know, that you procrastinate on that yeah. assignment, right? It's, you know, it's okay that... Uh, you know, you had to do things a few times and, and finally got it. Or if you work a different way than other people, that's all right. That's, that's you. That's a part yeah. of you. And I mean, the whole, I think a big difficulty of all this is the whole concept of the self. Like who is your self? Who is your genuine self is oh, yeah. built from other people. We aren't like born. David Lynch would like that. Yeah, David Lynch yeah. would like that. Who is <laughs> right <laughs> it's a big purple <laughs> sea um <laughs> yeah exactly uh so yeah i mean our our concept of self you know you're not born with a concept of yourself that's built from other people and so it's really hard to know what's your genuine self because you've built your entire mind basically from what other people have said what other people have told you is right what other people have told you is valuable and, you know, accomplishments, activities, things that have like a milestone, things that have a yardstick, things that have something concrete and you know that, okay, I accomplished something. That's so much more cut and dried than trying to identify yourself, your values. It's so nebulous. It takes so much more intuition and it could be a lot easier to, you know, follow the yardstick. Yeah. That someone else gave you. <laughs> it's harder to, yeah, it's exactly right. It's, it's, it's what, um, it's the expectations of others versus to exploring who we yeah. are. Right. And what, you know, you, you ask a very good question. What risk are you willing to take that might move you to a path where you can feel like your genuine yeah. self? And, you know, that's without any parameters, right. you know, those are the exercises that, if you really want to break out of imposter syndrome, who is your genuine self? And I got to move toward that every day, even if that means giving up the yardstick, yeah, giving up the you yardstick. Know. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know what? I got a fortune cookie once that I thought was so wise yeah. that I have like lived my life ever since in accordance with this fortune cookie. And okay. I shit you not. Um, so the fortune cookie 
Like, I here. opened it yeah. up and it said, risk may cause failure, but success cannot come without it. Mm-hmm. And so risk may cause, risk may cause failure, but success, success cannot come without it. So that's kind of, you know, if you, if you have imposter syndrome and you take a step back and assume the worst case scenario, so worst case scenario, you are an imposter. You know, you're not really cut out for this. You haven't really achieved. You've been able to maintain appearances, but there's some sort of flaw. You know, there's some sort of fatal flaw in the foundation that's going to bring it all down. Okay, assume that's true. Assume you are an imposter. Uh, so yeah, what's your plan B? What are you willing to risk to find out if maybe there's something where you wouldn't be an imposter, where you would feel genuine? You know, are you are you willing to take the first job that you get? <laughs> And it's, it's much riskier than shooting for that yeah. A, right? Or shooting for that promotion. You know what's really risky? The real oh. risk is what? living a life that you're not satisfied with because you're striving to meet other people's goals, essentially. Amen. Can we end on that? No, that I want to end. I had something I wanted to end on. I had a little, I'm, I'm no, busting no, out no, a little no. Marcus really. But that was so that was so beautiful. You put okay. Now I'm gonna okay. Go ahead. I don't want to take okay. it away. Well, no, because I want to end on someone else's words because this is imposter syndrome, right? Okay. Um, so okay. it's all about someone else. Um, all right. You ready for this? Mm-hmm. Ambition means tying your well-being to what other people say or do. Self-indulgence means tying to the things that happen to you. Sanity means tying it to your own actions. Oh, I love that. That's great. Okay, that's All definitely right. what you end on. I mean, what you said was good, but what Marcus Aurelius I mean, said, I'm, I'm, I'm no Marcus Aurelius, <laughs> and I don't want to be. That would not be my genuine self. No, thank you. <laughs> Emily, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank it's you so much. I love talking to you. And please come on again, okay? I would love to. Again, I have okay? so much to say. You too. Take care. <laughs>